Uh, grace and peace be to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, thanks for joining me today in this video. Uh, my name is G. Bruce Greer. I'm the author of a number of books in my New Covenant Understanding series. Um, this video today is a portion, a chapter from this book, uh, Introduction to a New Covenant Understanding of One Month, subtitled based, uh, Replacing rather Old Covenant-Based Theories of Atonement. And so uh, this video today is chapter four of that book, as all the chapters in that uh, larger book, which I call uh, by its acronym, INCUA, Introduction to New Covenant Understanding of Atonement, at one month rather. Uh, so chapter four is also republished in this smaller booklet, and you can see it's a thin and um, all these uh, component books of INCUA uh, are, uh, I believe they're all available on Amazon.com for approximately $5, which makes them very affordable to hand out or use in a group. And they're narrowly focused on one aspect of this new covenant at one month that, uh, that the book itself is trying to introduce to people. So this chapter now is entitled uh, and this book is Our Problem, Our a Alienation Inherited by Nature, subtitled, but the first Adam passed along, Christ came to transform. And that'll make more sense as we get into this chapter. So um, there are uh, any number of areas of theology that are quite important, both, and I would say proper and good theology is 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 useful and and can be useful and, and must be useful in the individual life of the believer as well as in the body of Christ. Uh, this is not an exercise in scholasticism or any form of uh, intellectualism or any other uh, form of just building up uh, knowledge upon knowledge without any purpose. True and good theology will give us both a better understanding of God himself and uh, then also the portion that we're going to look at, that part of theology we're looking at today is how we understand ourselves and mankind, both outside of Christ and in Christ. And um, that would be under the uh, heading of anthropology. So if theology is the study of God himself, then this portion that we're talking about is anthropology. And someone once told me, that um, true humility, now we're talking about how we understand ourselves, is neither having a more higher opinion of yourself than you ought, nor a lower opinion of yourself that you ought. Then those are both two errors that are pretty are ter can be terrible and lead to problems in both our human life, our inter interactions with the Lord himself and others. So what we're going to try to do today is explain the problem that mankind inherited in Adam but which has been removed and solved in Christ. So let me open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> uh, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and Holy Spirit, uh, thank you for the revelation you've given us of yourself. And as you continue to expand our knowledge of you and we grow in that knowledge of you and your nature, uh, it leads to our praise and also leads to our transformation. But Lord, we also pray that in this session today that we would better come to understand uh, the position that we were in as being born into Adam originally, but now that we're born into your, by your spirit, into your divine family, and your workings within us and within the body of Christ, that we might individually and collectively grow in your image, in love, in all your, the fruit of the Holy Spirit experienced among, in our lives and among uh, both believers and outsiders as well. So, uh, Heavenly Father, I pray, and Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, that we would see you more clearly, that we would love you more dearly, and that we'd walk with you more nearly in this area that we talk about day by day. In Jesus' name I pray. So, I've already given you a little bit of an introduction to chapter four. I think I'll just uh, jump to the chapter now uh, and let it do its the job of dealing with the subject, and I will make some interjections as we go along. 
So chapter four in your um, in the fuller copy of this full book, it begins on page 89. And here is the chapter four entitled Our Problem, Our Alienation Inherited by Nature. Chapter four overview. The earliest expression of God's purpose for man is relationship with like kind beings, parenthetically, those being made into his image and parent, and more expressly in the closest relationships, covenant kinship, that is new covenant at one month. This chapter addresses man's inherent problems that God had needed to overcome to bring about this new covenant at one month. The problem is that man himself is naturally alienated from God because of a self-centered human nature, beginning with Adam, and I add there, even before the, quote, fall, end quote, and coming into those, and continuing in those made in Adam's image. The Western church has misunderstood sin as various attitudes or behaviors that cause God to separate himself from sinful man. However, it is man's willful separation from God that is sin itself. Christ's work was to reconcile the world to God, not to reconcile God in the world. Christ's work and the work of the Holy Spirit was and is to reveal the love and goodness of God to man and remove all sin and self-consciousness in men's hearts and minds that keeps them from drawing near to God. His goal is to unite Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with those who receive his Holy Spirit so that we individually and collectively become one with him and with one another. Now, the first section then, now we're going to start getting into uh, an understanding of, of the nature of sin, what sin ultimately is. So the question I ask next in this section heading is, do our sins separate us from God? And that's a commonly held proposition. Or to the contrary of that, is our separation itself the sin? Okay, I hope you see two sides of the same of the different coin. If you were to ask the average Bible-believing Christian what sin is, you would likely get answers having to do with some errant form of behavior. This is the most prevailing understanding of sin. The Greek word translated sin in most English translations is harmartia, which is a noun, and the related verb is harmartano. Theresen Smith's Bible Dictionary gives these definitions for the Greek word i uh, translated as sin, amartia. One, the first and primary meaning is to be without a share in. Number two is to miss the mark. You'll hear a lot of Christians use that language. Three, to err or be mistaken. Four, to miss or wander from the path of uprightness and honor or do or go wrong. Or five, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law, sin. Those are the five uses that uh, in the interlinear says people apply to that word sin. Now, to understand the Greek word harmartia, meaning, quote, the first meaning is to be without a share in. Consider the root of harmartia is the Greek word ameros, which is made up from the Greek word meros, meaning a part, with the prefix of a which means without, which leads to ameros, without, and literally without a part. Uh, have you ever heard anyone define sin as to be without a share in? Uh, or I'd like to be apart from, or uh, as we'll see, I developed this into a phrasing that I've used for sin. It's the willful, our willful independence from the life and will of God of the Lord. I actually, I prefer that. So to, um, it's our, sin itself is defined by our willful independence from the life and will of the Lord. That's where apart from anything to do with his life, when we are apart from his life and apart from his will, that in itself is the root of sin. It's a separation that we have caused through our willful independence. So anyway, back to the book, more likely you've heard the second definition, that is, quote, to miss the mark. Here's the fundamental difference between the new covenant understandings and the old covenant understandings of sin. The new covenant problem is man's willful desire to be apart from God. 
and not sharing his life and the, quote, lordship, end quote, of that life with God. Men want to be their own master. They want to be their own God. They sometimes even want to be God himself. They do not want to have a shared life and under the uh, lordship of Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is the definition of sin that, that I find most useful. The old covenant understanding, however, by contrast, is expressed in the other four definitions, all having to do with behaviors contrary to some standard as exempt, explicitly stated in definition number five, quote, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law, sin, end quote. So we have two different definitional bases. The old covenant typically is an external, as we saw in the previous uh, chapter, chapter three, the old covenant was an external covenant and looked at things from an external point of view. So when we find Christians then evaluating people's behavior on outward circumstances, that's using old covenant lens to look at what sin might mean. However, the new covenant that we saw last chapter is a covenant, um, a covenant altogether unlike the old covenant, but it's a new covenant, a kainos kind of new, that's inward. And so it's the inward direction of our heart and our spirit. So when we are united to Father, Son, Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, that's our union in Christ to be covered more in chapter 10, then we are no longer apart from God. We are with him. However, if we set our minds to live, even though we are forever united with Father, Son, Holy Spirit in that divine union, uh, if we decide our minds to walk a different way, uh, we have mentally chosen to, in our actions, act apart from that fundamental relationship and eternal relationship that we have. And of course, then we end up, Christians can sin, even though we're united with Father, Son, Holy Spirit through Christ. Um, so the new, coming back to the text, the New Testament epistles use the noun form, that is harmartia of sin, 106 times in the verb form, harmartano, 25 times, particularly in the book of, so you can see the noun form is more much more common in the overall New Testament. Particularly in the book of Romans, sin is a state of being that is a noun, not a state of doing, which would be a verb. Most importantly, sin's first definition is to be without a share in. That is to be in a state of not sharing in the life and purposes of God. So I hope you see that. That's that's a state. And so uh, even though uh, uh, David describes himself as being born into sin in a state, where that little infant uh, has not broken any of the commandments or done anything like that, but his sin is that of a self-centered human being that is not yet sharing in the life and purpose of God for him. And uh, we'll find even in infants a uh, very willful personality and ex ex exemplified all the time, probably most perfectly in children who always uh, need and seek their own. Um, and sometimes by various means, humans as the non-Christians have learned to be selfless and others seeking, but it's not in our nature. It has to be trained and learned into people. Going back anyway, this was the original sin, Adam and Eve willfully choosing to live independent of God and trying to become God-like through means other than God's life working in them. So under this definition, our desire to be independent or separate from God is the very nature of sin itself. When we see man's behavior as requiring outward improvement, we miss the mark. It is man's entire nature that needs to change initiated by the new birth in Christ and accomplished through the transformational work of the Holy Spirit with our cooperation. This process is the heart of New Covenant One Man. Now I'm going to segue a bit into an expression I've heard that helps um, exemplify what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, maybe you've heard this before, but uh, Christ did not come in order to make bad men good. He came to make dead men alive. So when we look at behavior only, 
and we're looking at bad behavior and only trying to correct behavior, we totally miss the mark of God's purpose for us. Uh, we were, all, with everyone in Adam, scriptures teach us who we were dead in our sins. We were dead in our nature. We had no spiritual life to ourselves uh, apart from coming into union and new birth with the Spirit of God. So that was the major problem Christ needed to face. Not only were we dead, but in our natural Adamic nature, we were, as we will come to see, we were very, both self-centered, self-conscious, and sin-conscious, and that'll all be worn out. And those are things that prevented us uh, in Adam from a relationship with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that'll be developed in this chapter. So going on, the next um, heading is, is death the punishment for or the consequence of separation from God? So how significant is our willful independence from God? I answer, it's a matter of life and death, or you could say of eternal life or eternal death. The first, Adam, uh, the first commandment given to Adam was this, and this is Genesis 2.16. The Lord commanded the man, saying, For any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. End of passage. An old covenant perspective might see this as an arbitrary commandment given to test man's obedience, and I've heard many describe it that way. I have heard many Bible teachers explain this passage in this manner. I guess I'm repeating myself. However, if you consider that God's purpose for man was to be part of a large family of humans made into his image, you might understand the commandment is a serious warning, such as a parent would issue their um, undiscerning children, uh, as such as, quote, don't ever touch that hot stove, it'll burn you. Or probably more closely, quote, don't ever eat of that poisonous fruit. It's don't eat of that rotten fruit, it's poisonous. It's it will kill you, end of quote. After all, Adam and Eve at this point in the biblical meta-narrative don't even know right from wrong. So why would God warn Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Is knowing right from wrong the problem? Hardly, as the writer of Hebrews explains, the cha challenging his readers towards the maturity. Now I'm reading out of Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he's an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. End of passage. The writer here, the writer of Hebrews, is speaking to born-again Christians who have not grown in their knowledge of righteousness, that remaining infants, perhaps like Adam and Eve. The point in Hebrews is that it is the Holy Spirit himself who trains Christians to discern good from evil. This is a growing process integral to the new covenant. The difference between this and Adam and Eve is that the new covenant maturity is gained through transformation brought about through participatory union with God and not by any means independent of God, such as eating the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And I might just say for people, uh, there's some amount, I hear this in some theologies of a restoration of restoring us backwards to Adam. Adam never enjoyed the union and intimacy that we have and is available to us through the new covenant with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nor did they have an indwelling Holy Spirit, uh, both to uh, speak to them, to guide them, to lead them, to train them up in righteousness. Rather, they sought that external um, knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, to bring about what could never be accomplished through that, could only be accomplished through this union, through the Spirit, within Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And there, there comes are growing, learning, and transforming into that image with his constant uh, guidance. Now, back to the text. So coming to God's warning, you understand, quote, death, end quote, to be the punishment for sin or the consequence of sin of living independently from God. For many Old Covenant Christians, I'm afraid that death alone is not enough. 
as a punishment, eternal torment is required for violation of God's commandments. Uh, now, I, I hope you see in my attitude that I treat that as totally incorrect. Beyond that, it's blasphemous to the character of God. Uh, parenthetically, for a deeper development of the consequences of willful separation from God, see my book, The Debate Over Hell. And there, I, you may realize that I maintain a position called conditional immortality, that the consequences of sin is death. Ultimately, it's called the second death in um, Revelation chapter 20. And that is a final and final death to those that don't ever receive their names are not written in the book of life and they never have eternal life. The ultimate consequence is perishing, it describes it as, as perishing in the lake of fire, which is not hell. Those are two, because hell itself is thrown in the lake of fire. Uh, going on, though, uh, there's better news for that, uh, that those who do eat of the tree of life, which is the other tree to, that we can eat from, then we have eternal life and we have that relationship through um, the Spirit with Father, Son, Holy Spirit and collectively with the body of Christ. However, if you understand man to be a mortal being, proven by the very warning that Adam would die if he ate of the tree of knowledge, you see that willfully separate, separating oneself from God would naturally lead to death, not as a punishment to someone as a result of disobedience. What if you were a deep sea diver using an oxygen line to allow you to roam the bottom of the sea? How dependent are you upon this source of oxygen? Well, it's a matter of life and death. So if our union with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is likened to the oxygen line, sin would be deciding that you could live just fine without the oxygen line. You would be able to continue to live for some time, depending on your conditioning, but separating yourself from the oxygen line would ultimately and inevitably result in death. In your Christian walk, you may think that you can do all right by leaving the oxygen line at times and returning for a hit of oxygen periodically, parenthetically Sundays, and question mark, or you, or when you start to experience the consequences of being without oxygen. Unfortunately, that describes a good part of Christianity, thinking that we can live independently from God and call upon him for oxygen whenever things start to go wrong. New Covenant at one moment, however, requires recognizes our constant union and life with God as a fundamental to having eternal life. If we choose our own self-willed independence from God, however, like the first Adam and Eve did, then we cut ourselves off from the oxygen of God and as a result, wither, suffocate, and die from lack of spiritual oxygen, that being eternal life. For those who never eat of the tree of life, that is those who never partake of the eternal life of God, only a second death awaits, and that's Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. In the meantime, his life dwelling in us gives us life to our mortal bodies, brings health, well-being, and strength, which is greatly released through our ultimate bodily re resurrection. In other words, this union with and in the life of God himself leads to life, prosperity, transformation, ultimately resurrection, and eternal life. So my, the point in all this session, by this analogy with the um, deep sea diver, is how important this union is with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and walking in his spirit. And even though we're born of that spirit and we are in Christ and Christ is us, as is the Father and the Holy Spirit, uh, when we choose to walk our own direction and our own will, uh, Paul says even the mindset, and this is Romans chapter 8, even if we put our mind on the flesh, that means we put our mind on ourselves, our needs, our demands, uh, being self-centered. He says that leads to death, and it even leads to some forms of death in our Christian walk. However, Paul encourages us to walk, set our mind on the Spirit, and to walk in the Spirit. And in doing that, we have a full flow of oxygen to us constantly, and we need that oxygen for the strength that life, this current life, requires and for the good works that God um, has in mind for us. That's Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 8 through 10, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Uh, going on, the next section now, we're going to, it's called the Genesis 2 uh, to 3 account, the two trees and our alienation from God. 
We now turn to Genesis chapter 2 and 3 to better understand what God needed to do in order to bring about new covenant at one moment into realization. We are all probably at least somewhat familiar with this narrative of how mankind became alienated from God. Now, we will look at the following aspects of this story. Number one, we're going to look at the nature of the two trees. That is the tree of knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of life. Second, we'll look at the essential nature of Adam and Eve's sin, that is, their own, their seeking independence from God. Three, we'll look at the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin, that is, which the consequences were an alienation from God, but not separation nor God's alienation towards them. Be clear on that. Number four, we'll look at the curses and promises that came from that, Satan being the one curse and a redeemer being promised to mankind. Number five, we'll look at um, God's symbolic atonement for Adam and Eve's sin, which was a temporary animal substitution. And number six, we'll see what it means where God blocked the way to the tree of life and his reasons for doing so. Parenthetically, our need to see God's love in order to believe and receive forgiveness and relationship. I'll explain that as we go on. So first, the next section is number one is the nature of the trees. Genesis chapter 2 and 3 are critical to understanding the problems that God needs to overcome to accomplish his purpose, purpose of at one with men. First, the fact that there are two important trees. I'm reading Genesis 2, 9, and then 16 and 7, 17. Out of the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Now capture that language. The tree of life was put right in the midst of the garden. And the tree of knowledge and good and evil, three dots. The Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat in it you will surely die. In passage. <clears throat> the tree of life here is a symbol of eternal life. The expression, quote, tree of life, end quote, other than in a few Proverbs, is only found in this Genesis chapter 2 and 3 account and also in Revelation 22. In Genesis 2, 19, the tree of life is found in the midst of the garden. In Genesis 3, 17, Adam and Eve in their state of fear and alienation towards God are evicted from the garden to keep them from eating the tree of life parenthetically, lest they live forever in that natural state of um, alienation. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, it really took Christ's demonstration of God's love uh, fully, most clearly and most forcefully seen in his laying down his life for all of us uh, to convince us of God's love and acceptance and forgiveness. So we'll come back to that theme. In Revelation 22, 1 and 2, the tree of life is now fully accessible to all who are in the new heaven and new earth. I'm going to read that passage now. Then he showed me a river of life, a water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the, and in the mid, middle of its tree, street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 fruit, bearing its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were, were for the healing of the nations, end of quote. So the tree of life is easily identified with the eternal life because eating from it provides both eternal life and healing. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a bit trickier as a typology. God warned Adam and Eve that eating of it leads to death, but some Bible commentators think that eating this tree is, is good. I'm referring to, I at the time I was writing this, I had recently heard... Uh, seminarian the, uh, professor uh, speak as that was a good thing that they did a tree of knowledge because then they learned what good was. Well, my God, I, I don't know how you could become a seminary professor and not understand how that needing that tree led to death, which is so clear both in the account itself and later in the epistles where, where Paul uses this very explanation. But in any event, not only from that Bible interpreter's mind, not only should God's warning cause us to avoid it, that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but the Apostle Paul ties the curse of the tree 
with the curse of being under the law. And we'll see these two. So this is connecting the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with the, with the, the curse of the law itself. Paul says in Galatians 3, 10 through 13, for as many are of the works of the law, you could just easily say, are the works of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. Or you could say of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you're doing evil, uh, you're cursed. You're trying to do live a righteous life by knowing principles of good and evil, that it will become a curse to you to perform them. Christ, three dots. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law and from that, also add from that tree, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. End of quote. In fact, I would maintain that the cross as a tree was the very tree symbolically of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate from that led to death. So Christ eats of that, uh, hangs himself on that very tree and absorbs the consequences of that sin upon himself, dies, and of course, as you know, through his indestructible life, then he is resurrected. So the, going on in the text, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolizes the law that brings about the curse of death for anyone not keeping the full law. To sum up, these two trees, trees represent two ways of living. One, the tree of life represents living from the eternal life of God in Christ. And two, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents living from any external standard of right and wrong rather than from the indwelling spirit of God. The first is full of God's blessings and the second full of curses and death. So uh, we should be always conscious which tree we're trying to live from tree of life, which is union and guidance by the Holy Spirit uh, or or the knowledge of good and evil, which could even mean the knowledge of good and evil principles is found in the Bible if that's how you are living your life. So uh, take that warning for what it's worth. Uh, number two, now we're going to look at the essential nature of Adam and Eve's sin. Uh, what was the center of this temptation for Adam and Eve? Now I'm reading uh, from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, the serpent said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from that tree of the garden. Of course, there's the first temptation questioning uh, what God has spoken. Uh, the woman said to the serpent, quote, From the tr fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, by the way, she got that little bit of information wrong because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not in the center. It was the tree of life that was described as being in the center of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Well, she added language there, which is not in, in uh, the original speaking. Now, I will add here that um, from the text, God spoke this uh, warning about the tree of knowledge and good and evil to, directly to Adam. It never says that he spoke that to Eve. Uh, possibly she, uh, she heard this from Adam and may have gotten it incorrect, either from Adam's mistelling of it or from her misunderstanding. But one way or the other, uh, she was, and this is a danger, I would say, in Christian living, is uh, we should be listening and hearing the voice of the Lord for ourselves never trying to live by principles that other people have heard and have applied. Uh, we can learn from that, but we need to be hearing the voice of the Lord for ourselves because it's a living word. It's the very life and breath of God himself speaking to us and interpreting it for us. Um, and that, that is uh, the life-giving and way to go things. And we can make all kinds of errors trying to live on other people's uh, redigested bread, if you know what I mean. Christ is the bread of life. They may have heard something from the Lord, and we just take it for that without letting the Holy Spirit um, feed us and, and reveal to us ourselves. Uh, in any event, uh, moving right along. Uh, the serpent then said to the woman, you will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. 
it sounds pretty good to her, I guess. When the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make wise, then she took from her fruit and ate, and she also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Okay, that's in the passage. So the serpent suggested here that eating the tree of knowledge would make them wise and would open their eyes to be like God. Wanting to be like God, independent of God and his life itself, is the crux of this desire and ultimately was the sin of Adam and Eve. It is also the center of what constitutes sin in all of Adam and Eve's offspring. I hope you see what I'm saying here, is that we, we should not expect or try to, uh, in our own selves, through any principles or practices or even theology itself, try to make ourselves to be like God. Uh, you may have heard of movements like, um, uh, what would Jesus do? Or or even the expression of Christ's followers is, is, a, is a mistaken path. We join ourselves with him and he then leads us. A psalmist says that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his sake. So when we're joined with him, we can count on him leading us. Uh, not that we can do anything apart from him. And that's Christ's own words in John 15. From apart from me, you can do nothing. And you can't live the Christian life apart from me. Although many, um, I guess, do some job of trying to fake it. But honestly, it's never real. Paul says in Romans chapter 10, he says that the, and you can be quite zealous about it. Paul speaks of the, his uh, Jewish brethren. He says uh, they, they had a zeal for God, but they had no knowledge of righteousness. So in not understanding the righteousness of God is a gift to them in his own person and character, then um, they became self-righteous. And that can certainly happen in in religious people. It happened to people of Jesus' day and it happens to people today. So again, this comes back to which tree are we eating from and living from? And I hope that you're eating from the tree that is Christ uh, and not from the tree of, of any other external methods of good and evil. Number three, the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin. And uh, this created six problems that God himself needed to overcome in bringing about his ultimate goal, which is that new covenant atonement with us in a born again and in a family uh, of, of shared nature and of coming everybody uh, of us in the body of Christ being conformed to the image of his son so that Christ would be the firstborn of many brethren. So here we go. Adam and Eve's sin created six problems for them and for us to go far beyond God's need to forgive sin or some need to, quote, satisfy, end quote, some offense towards God. Now, you'll recognize that when you come into atonement theories, there's a whole plethora of various forms that God's, something about God was offended and needs to be satisfied, therefore that demands payment, and that's a uh, theories that are lumped together, and they're called satisfaction theories of atonement, which I reject totally. Uh, God did not need something uh, to be a to be placated or propitiated or appeased in order to accept and forgive us. In fact, we'll see that um, uh, Romans 5, 8 says, for while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ was dying and laying down his life without demand from us other than receive that by faith. Going back to the text, however, though, each of the following consequences of sin prevents our at one moment with God so that each represents something Christ came to do away with. And I'm just going to list them, and then we'll go look at the more detail. One is the very knowledge of good and evil, which now became part of our demic nature. Uh, I'll explain these more deeply as we go. Number two is the condemnation the law brings, causing guilt and shame. C is our need to cover up and hide from God. D is our fear for, of God. D, I'm talking about the natural consequence of natural man. E of our need to blame and shift guilt. And ultimately, F of our death. So let's just take them one at one. And these are things that Christ has come to overcome in order to bring us in this state of new covenant one that that uh, that he wants for us. So A, the knowledge of good and evil, now part of the endemic nature. 
The first problem is that Adam and Eve's shift from a state of in, ignorant, innocent ignorance to knowing good and evil built an internal law in all humans from birth, and they cannot keep that they cannot keep in and of themselves. And this is I'm reading from Romans chapter two, verses fourteen to fifteen. For when the Gentiles, this would be people that had no knowledge of the law, do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law. These, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately, now listen to this, their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. That's the end of the passage. In this passage, we see that even Gentiles who were never given or under the Mosaic law have a law written in their hearts. We might think that an eternal law in natural man is a good thing, but the Apostle Paul says that this internal conscience causes their thoughts to either accuse or defend them. Warning, Adam and Eve about eating the tree of knowledge and good and evil led to all kinds of problems, and this internalized tree continues to plague natural man. Again, now let me just say that. Because mankind have some sense naturally, uh, the Apostle Paul says, then they either need to, um, uh, it's either accusing them, putting them under guilt and shame, or they're defending themselves, going to some various versions of self-defense. You may have heard of a hardened conscience where someone uh, builds up a conscience uh, trying to convince themselves that some behavior that they otherwise would know would be wrong. They want to continue in that behavior, so they build the hardened conscience. Now, uh, I'm going to say here, the people that say be led by your conscience uh, don't fully understand the human conscience. It is subject to manipulation, to, uh, to be uh, formed in, in very many ways that are uh, destructive. And that uh, co goes on commonly among human beings. It goes on in our common culture today, trying to form, misform uh, the human conscience of, of all of us, but specifically the younger, the better, the, in the education and every other way that they can form a culturally minded conscious, which accepts all kinds of things that biblically are, according to law, are, um, are inappropriate and sinful. Well, then what have we done? We've, we, when we start relying on that man-made conscious, then that can lead us into all kinds of behavioral errors. Now, as I've been talking about, we aren't to be led by either one. Uh, we are to be led uh, in a transformed state through union in Christ by the indwelling Holy Spirit uh, and not by our conscience. Christ himself may, uh, and the Holy Spirit will work on our, our conscience more accurately. Romans says that, uh, that there will be uh, a conforming of our mind, his will, a uh, transforming of our, our mind uh, in Romans chapter 12. So that's what we're looking for. But it begins at that internal man who's in union and communication with the Holy Spirit, and it works its way outwardly. We talked about that, I believe, in the last chapter. Um, so moving on, though. Again, I'm saying knowing good and evil is not wrong, but having a, having a law always condemning oneself because of a natural inability to keep it is wrong for man. It's not God's highest and best for man. This is the tragic condition of natural man and living apart from the spirit of God. Our sense of right and wrong is always condemning us or we are constantly defending our independent decisions. The new covenant, by comparison, brings us into a condition of rest in Christ's righteousness and the Holy Spirit himself leads us without condemnation. Romans 8, 11. Now in Christ, there's no condemnation. And so that by the spirit of, and by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 2. So we don't need the external law any more, any more than we need the law. We saw last uh, chapter three, where we saw that uh, the law was a means to bring us to Christ through our recognition that we could never keep the law and our need to have a, a different covenant and different relationship through Christ as our savior and as a high priest of a new covenant. Going on now, number B then is the other problem resulting from Adam and Eve's eating that tree of knowledge of good and evil is condemnation from the law causing guilt and sin. So direct correlates, lower, 
corollaries to law are condem condemnation, guilt, and shame. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of God, they came knowledge rather tree of knowledge. They came under a system of condemnation, guilt, and shame. Uh, Romans five eighteen says, "Quote." Through one transgression, that is the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, eating from the wrong tree, there resulted condemnation to all men. End quote. This condemnation is not from God himself, but from the very standard of the law that Adam and Eve received by eating from the tree of knowledge and good and evil. This passage compares the ministry of the old covenant with that of the new covenant. Now, we've read this uh, portion. This is a portion of a longer passage, Second Corinthians three six through nine uh paul speaking of himself as a minister of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life three dots for the ministry of condemnation remember from last time that is speaking of the old covenant the covenant of external laws knowledge of good and evil what must i do what can't i do if i can just practice doing the right and wrong uh, that'll everything will work out fine that will always bring, Paul calls that a ministry of condemnation. If that, if, well, if the ministry of condemnation has some glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound. Now, there's the difference. Uh, one is knowing what's right. The other is a ministry of righteousness. When we receive the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, we are receiving the full righteousness of God in dwellingness. Paul says elsewhere, uh, don't you know, for speaking to Christians now, don't you know that you are a temple of God and that you are holy? The temple is holy, and that's what you are. You're holy. We have been made righteous and holy through union in Christ. That does not mean um, our behavior always reflects that reality. And, of course, that's the work of the Holy Spirit with our willful participation uh, to uh, see that our external behaviors line up with our true identity in Christ. Uh, and the righteousness that has been imputed to us. And I expensed, I think it was last session that we talked about, this is an um, imparted righteousness, not an imputed righteousness. By imparted, I mean, Paul says that we were created in righteousness. This isn't a fiction. This is part of our new reality, new uh, identity in Christ, that we were created in righteousness. And that's our spirit. That spirit then, if we let the spirit of God effect in our spirit, work its way through our soul and our outward behavior, then uh, we are in harmony, body, soul, and spirit with um, with what God is doing in us. Uh, now, number C, our need to cover up and hide from God. The ultimate human response after eating the tree of knowledge was, quote, then the eyes of them were open and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings, end quote, Genesis 3, 7. So the effect of knowing good and evil was an eye-opening self-consciousness, including a knowledge of their nakedness. The Hebrew word translated naked in verse 7 is iram, from the Hebrew word aram, meaning to, quote, be subtle, be shrewd, be crafty, beware, Take crafty counsel, be prudent, end quote. Interesting, this is the same root for the serpent's craftiness. Isn't that something? That um, the very being naked now made us like uh, Satan uh, in, in, in this need to be crafty and cover up and do many other things. Now, quote, uh, now the serpent was more crafty than he beast to feel. Now I'm going to quote, here's how... Um, an author by the name of Wabi uh, explains this uh, nakedness and craftiness. So I'm quoting from his book of 2014. In Genesis 2.15, we read, quote, both the man and his wife were naked, Hebrew Aram, yet felt no shame. In the next verse, we read, now the serpent was more subtle, Aram, than any beast of the field, end quote. So we translated Aram as naked in one instant and subtle in another. Why? Genesis 42, 9 might help to explain. Here Joseph says, you are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. The accusation is they have come to find places where borders are vulnerable to penetration. To be naked is to be vulnerable. 
the condition that has a potential for either intimacy or harm. The man and his wife were both naked, yet felt no shame. That was before they eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, so they could have an intimate relationship without shame. They felt no shame because they had never used this condition of vulnerability to harm one another. The serpent is more aram or subtle than any of the other bees. Unlike other creatures, the serpent has no hands or no feet with which to protect itself. As such, the serpent is an ideal symbol of this vulnerability and how it could be twisted to harm. And that's the end of my quote. I think we can understand the need for subtly, subtil, sub, subtly, I'm not sure how I should pronounce my, the only word I use, sub, subtility connected with nakedness. We instinctively know how vulnerable we are to others if they see us naked, that is in our natural state. This would include seeing our natural response to them and those around us. This could be part of the reason that Adam and Eve's immediate reaction was to sew fig leaves together and cover their loins. This was a protective action. They did not want to be seen as they are now were seen. And I think we all know that experience where we, we may put on a mask of what our true feelings or thoughts are in interacting with other people. Yeah, we don't want them to, to know our thoughts. Sometimes we step out and... Uh, Unfortunately, let people know what we're thinking about them if, if they're unkind thoughts or unfair thoughts. Um, and that's unfortunate, but that's uh, we're being naked with them. Uh, but the Satan was more subtle. You can see that in his deceit of Adam and Eve, that he and the tree itself, to a degree, was this subtle. Uh, Eve saw it as a fruit good to eat and as something to be desired and bringing about wisdom, which seems to be on the surface would seem to be a good thing. And yet, that was a deceitfulness. Uh, you could even say it was a uh, craftiness of that tree that, uh, and of the Satan to get us to eat the tree. Going back to the text, uh, next, quote, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man said to man and his wife, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. End quote, Genesis 3, 8. The effect of this self-consciousness was to hide from God. This has become the default setting for a natural man, covering up and hiding from God. Uh, Jesus speaks of the current condition of the world in that very similar way. This is John 3, 16 through 21. Um, this may become, this may be, I'm sure the first part is very familiar to all of us and maybe the whole passage, but it, Jesus and Jesus were for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. This now right there. Uh, the lack of believing in the goodness and the good nature of God is what's preventing people from eternal life. So uh, I'm going to come back to chapter 12 and talk about how we present the gospel uh, to be an effective gospel. What are we leading people to? Uh, we're not just leading them to be forgiven from an angry God. We are leading them into a relationship with a loving God uh, who in order they need to overcome their alienation caused by guilt and shame and desire to be their own God, if, if they are willing to lay that down and the consequences of that down, then they can receive new life from Christ and be transformed, uh, as we see, as all of us will ultimately be transformed into his image. This is the judgment that the light has come in the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does not does evil, hates the light, does not come in the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But that sure sounds like Adam and Eve hiding from God. They don't want their deeds exposed. Neither do you can see this in children. Um, if they know something to be wrong, uh, you're not going to find them out parading through the living room doing it. They're going to be in the bedroom under their covers or out in the backyard somewhere uh, where they can't be seen. And of course, a lot of things uh, uh, Crime is done in the dark at night where uh, their activity can't be seen. 
But he who practices the truth comes to light so that his deeds may be manifested as, as having been wrought in God. End of passage. Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son with the purpose to give them eternal life to dead men. He did not send Jesus to judge. The world itself had already made a judgment about God and themselves. That's what the judgment is. If you really look at it, God was not judging them. They'd made a judgment in their own hearts uh, that God was uh, to be feared, uh, not to be uh, come close to. Jesus comes, quote, as the light of the world, end quote. The light does not condemn, quote, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, end quote, Romans 8, 1. Rather, men love darkness, separation from the light, rather than the light of, of God. So what is needed? Is the light's purpose to spotlight the darkness, as some might think? Uh, I've seen one ministry that proposes to be an evangelical ministry that uses the Ten Commandments to, to try to convince people that their, their actions or beliefs or thoughts are evil, thinking that that is what is necessary for them to come to Christ. So I come back and says, is the light's purpose to spotlight the darkness, or is it to remove the darkness by its very presence? If the darkness is man's self-centered independence, what could possibly cause them to love the light rather than that darkness? What could possibly love, cause them to, to give up that self-centeredness? Well, the scriptures make it clear there's the very love of God that it needs to be revealed. If Adam and Eve had known the love of God, they, would they have hid from him? I think not. Not knowing the loving, forgiving nature of God, they hid. That is the core problem that Jesus came to overcome. Contrary to what many Christians think, Jesus did not come to make bad men good. Jesus came to make dead men alive. Now, I want the weight of that to sink in a little bit in terms of this overcoming. Um, now, you will find used in the uh, New Testament the word English word repent. And I've spoken this elsewhere in the book. Uh, the Greek root for that English word repent is metanoia. And that's, a, a, like many Greek words, it's a compound word that you can break down into its components. Meta means change, like metamorphosis. We know that a butterfly changes from a, from a cocoon into a, a flying butterfly. That's a metamorphosis. Meta meaning change. Uh, noia, metanoia, repent, the Greek word for end, uh, Repentance is a change of our mind. What if the repentance that's needed is not to be self-centered, uh, causing people to say, oh, you need to repent. You need to look at your behavior and admit how bad it is versus you need a repentance of the mind, which is leading you to see rather than your concept of God who might be angry with you or doesn't want anything to do with you, but he is a God that so loved you that he sent his son that he would lay his life down to convince you of his loving acceptance of you. Now, that is closer, that is the gospel, uh, not the first, but the latter. And I'm sorry to say that the uh, traditional gospel, most often heard through the evangelical circles, is, uh, is showing the light on the darkness rather than having the light dispel and move the darkness. The darkness of our misunderstanding of the nature of God and his offer and desire to be in union with us. Okay, next section, uh, part D, our fear of God. Continuing with the effects of eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we find that men became afraid of God. And we've been talking about that already. So we see in Genesis 3, verses 8 and 10, quoting, they heard the, then they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of a day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Three dots. He, that is Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. End of passage. The preceding verse is the only verse that records God walking in the garden. Nothing in the verse suggests that God walked in the garden daily or even walked with Adam and Eve daily. I, I just want to, let's see. 
I'll, I'll finish the reading and I'll come back. We do find God speaking to God on a few occasions. The first time God speaks to God to Adam was in Genesis 1, 28 and 30, when he blessed the male and female and told them to multiply. Multiply. Here God is, and now that's the first time he's speaking to humans is in that. And here God is speaking to those in Christ, having been fully made in his image and not speaking to the person Adam and Eve specifically. Okay, now you need to understand that comment. You would have to read my book, Made or Being Made into His Image, to briefly see that Genesis chapter one is not speaking of the first Adam. It's speaking of Christ and those being made in Adam. It's a prologue. It's not the beginning of a story that uh, goes from A to B but it's the overall for the entire Bible. So we see it fulfilled in Christ and those of Christ. That's Genesis chapter one. Then we pick up in Genesis chapter two, beginning at two, four, the rest of the detailed, uh, I call it the micro account narrative of the Bible. And then we find this Adam and Eve who are, who are really not all that Christ-like, if, if you want to be honest about it. In fact, this whole image of Adam and Eve what I'm getting at here is this whole uh, image of Adam and Eve walking with God, knowing him. Uh, that's a fiction. Uh, I don't know why we want to so um, glorify that first Adam. Paul certainly doesn't. If you read chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he describes Adam as being from the earth and earthy, uh, contrasted with Christ who is heavenly and from the heaven. These are two different, uh, two different um, types for us. And so uh, I, I know there's a fictional story of this close relationship of Adam and Eve had with uh, Yahweh God. And yet, in fact, God, the translation for in the first chapter of Genesis uh, for God is the Greek word Elohim, which is perfectly fine. It's a, a God, uh, impersonal God in three persons, uh, because we find that when we move into chapter two and on, that the God that comes in or acts personally with like Adam and Eve, and then later with Abraham and many other biblical characters, is in the Old Testament is um, I'll use the name Yahweh, which is a form of the Hebrew letters Yu Hey Va Hey. But in any event, that is the personal God. We don't see uh, God in Genesis one being uh, using a personal name, nor do we see him talking to Adam and Eve. It is only in this instance where Adam and Eve, after they've sinned, they hear him walking. Uh, and then he comes, uh, as we'll see, that God himself comes and approaches and finds them and speaks to them. Uh, doesn't suggest to me, well, beyond that, if they really knew God and knew his character, then they would have trusted him and would have known that his warning to not eat that tree, they would regard it. And I hope that's where we find ourselves, not like Adam, who doesn't know the Lord. But as we grow to know the Lord, then we say, Lord, what is it you want from me? Uh, and if you warn me about things, then I want to stay away from them, too, because I know you to be good. And I'm maintaining, um, I don't even think this is speculation. I think the account carries itself. Adam and Eve did not know God, at least in that loving sense. That's why they hid from themselves. And that's why Christ had to come and die for that natural man, the natural man, because they, they need to be convinced of the loving nature of God, which they do not know. They're walking around in the darkness of a mist understanding of God and themselves and the light then comes that we've been talking about comes and presents through the person of Jesus Christ who now Jesus Christ is in a form and in his action in his life that is described in the gospels then is a self-sacrificing self-giving that's given up to us at the cross now we can see more clearly that this is someone I can trust and who loves me and I'm he is one that I would choose to make my Lord because he's for me and he's not asking me to serve him, as many people misunderstand. He's coming as a Melchizedek priest. I think we've talked about this past. He's come to minister life to me. And in that, I can join with him and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in, in our family purposes, whatever degree and amount of service that may or may not entail. Anyway, that was a long discourse, but I, I want to make these stories have some meaning beyond just a printed page. So. Coming back here, uh, God then speaks to the first Adam for the first time in Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is, I maintain, this is the very first time that we have God speaking with Adam. 
Uh, and after the pair had, uh, first time after the pair had eaten of the forbidden tree, he'd spoken to Adam before about for, uh, not eating from that tree, but now the, with this Adam and Eve pair, and the only words we have of Adam speaking to God are to answer God's questions of where Adam was and how he knew he was naked. Uh, and we saw this, uh, Genesis 3.10, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And the woman who he gave me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Uh, end of passage. There's no other scriptural reference of Adam speaking to God before or after this eating of the forbidden tree. Have you ever thought of how we go on in the account uh, as we continue on to Genesis chapter 4 and onward? Um, there's no further reference for Adam having any relationship with the Lord. Now we find that in uh, Abel, uh, Abel seems to have a relationship with the Lord. When he is killed, then Seth picks up that relationship and it continues on through the Seth's family line all the way to righteous Noah. But we don't see that character Adam having that even after this experience where God comes and forgives him, seeks him out, having a close relationship with the Lord. And another incidence of this is if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, which is called the faith chapter, it begins describing the faith of righteous people. It begins with God himself having faith when he spoke the world in existence. And then it goes on to speak uh, of Abel next, over skipping Adam. Um, so put that in your back of your mind. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. But uh, what I'm really suggesting is we don't, I start out this whole video episode talking about the mistake uh, of overestimating uh, our value or underestimating. And when we take Adam, we should see him as by as scriptures presented. He's a natural man made from the earth, capable and intended, as we saw in chapter two, God's purpose for Adam and all humanity was that they would be open, being filled with the Holy Spirit and being transformed in the image of Christ. But his, so his great value, uh, humanity, even apart from Christ, has great value to the Lord. And we have respect for all mankind, man, woman, boy and girl, uh, as possible receptors of, the, of Christ's spirit. And then once they become born of his spirit, now that we've joined us together in a family, we have even a close, should have, potentially can have a closer relationship with one another as family members. And I wish that worked uh, more effectively than it seems to be in the contemporary body of Christ. Um, now I'm picking this up again. Adam is apparently, when in, in, a, in the biblical account, Adam is apparently clueless about whatever constitutes good and evil, including the goodness of God himself. In other words, Adam is a perfect type of the natural man. He has an intelligence greater than any other animal. For instance, he is able to name each and every living creature. But there's nothing in the scriptural account to show that Adam knew God on any intimate basis or anything about God's nature, including his love and forgiveness. So, not surprisingly, after sinning, Adam and Eve were afraid of God. This is a natural understanding of God without knowing God personally. So, there... For there to be at one moment between man and God, all fear must be removed. I'm quoting 1 John 4, 8. There is no fear in love, but perfect love. That love, the agape love, uh, and that translation there would be agape, that, that love that God alone himself originates and begins in the life and heart of God himself and is given to those in Christ and shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Then that agape love works through us to others as well towards God and toward one another. But perfect love, that agape love, casts out fear because fear involves punishment. You can see right there that fear that Adam had, that there's going to be punishment here. Uh, he warned me about death. Now he's going to come and punish me. And the one who fears is not perfect in love. Adam was not perfected in the love of God himself. He expected God to come and smack him, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm adding a bit dramatically. But he had a fear of God. He expressed it himself. Uh, end of passage. Adam and Eve needed to be delivered from all fear of punishment. The law that they had eaten when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil put the conviction that punishment was necessary. But this fear needed to be removed if they were to have at one with God. 
This goes beyond simple forgiveness of sin. God had already forgiven Adam and Eve before they ever sinned. Quote, and, and then the reference for this would be Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That would mean that Christ died for Adam and Eve. Uh, he loved Adam and Eve uh, even though they had sinned. The Lord needed man not only to accept his forgiveness, but to be persuaded of God's love. thereby creating a desire for relationship with God. This was not only revealed to man, and this was not fully revealed to man until Christ came as God in the flesh and demonstrated God's love for us. Then, under the drawing power of the Holy Spirit, our hearts can be convinced and our minds can be changed toward God. That's the repentance I was talking about earlier that needs to happen. I'm convinced now that he's, he's a loving God. I'm convinced he loves me. And I'm convinced by that. I've never seen such love. So now I want to have a relationship with someone that loves me that much and accepts me for who I am. Now, we we do understand that the grace of God just, just expressed will ultimately lead to transformation. But that initial calling is not demanding transformation. It's, 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 it's inviting um a relationship not demanding transformation. Transformation doesn't come by demand. Transformation comes as a natural process of walking and knowing God. Even as you may have noticed in uh, a lot of marriages, I've been married now 50 years to my wife, that um, in union, human beings actually, sometimes part of them comes to act like one another. And you may even find a married couple, I do it all the time, say, well, we did something when in fact my wife did it, or maybe. I'll say we did something, and I it was something I did. Uh, the I and her often get fused into the we because that's what a union can accomplish, uh, not only in humans, but between the Lord and us. Um, picking it up again in the text, the revelation of God's love towards us is what turns our alienation from God to a desire for God and a sharing of our lives with him. How different the new covenant is in the light of God's love revealed through Christ, where believers are encouraged to, quote, draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need, end of quote. And I left out the reference there. It's a Hebrews reference I on the top of my head. I don't know specifically, but right of Hebrews says, this is the beauty of the new covenant now we can draw with confidence. We have confidence. Unlike this Adam, you can see Adam was full of fear and doubt about God. This transforming work of the Holy Spirit is now we have confidence in who he is and we can come full boldly before it. It says in, time, in our time of need, when I have sinned the worst, uh, when I have uh, done the worst things imaginable, possibly in my, uh, that it might happen, however great or small that might be, no matter what it is in my time of need, I know I can come to that throne. What is the throne called? It's called the throne of grace. It's not a throne of condemnation. It's not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. And God's grace is sufficient then to meet my need. Uh, uh, the Lord spoke to Paul and says, um, uh, uh, in your weakness, uh, I am made strong. My grace is sufficient for you. So that's saying that whatever it is you need, to fulfill this lacking, this even this uh, your inability to walk perfectly with me and in my ways, there's grace for that and receive that. Now that grace then enables us, Paul writing to Titus says, that grace will teach us godliness. We do learn through walking in him. And hopefully we don't continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. If that's true, then we haven't come to know the grace of God at work in our lives. The next section is called E, our blame and guilt shame shifting. Rearing the law's condemnation, not knowing the loving and forgiving nature of God leads to blame and guilt shifting. The tragic story continues this way. So we're picking this up now at Genesis 3, beginning at verses 11 through 13. And he, that is God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I command you not to eat? The man said, the woman who gave me 
she ate, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said, woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. End of passage. Anything new here? Adam blames both God, the woman who you gave me, and Eve. She gave me from the tree of life, while Eve blames the only other party left standing there, the serpent. The serpent deceived me. Under the new covenant of grace, it is easy to admit to God our wrongdoing, since we know that we are already forgiven. Now, I'll just segue again into talking about a confession of sins, which is a practice, an old covenant practice to continually come and bring sacrifices before the altar, uh, both either on a personal level or on the Day of Atonement, to try to cover up and receive a, a washing, a cleansing of our consciousness, at least under the Old Covenant, that's how it works. However, this throne of grace is not requiring that. There is a once-for-all forgiveness. We read uh, last time about, I think, believe it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, that by one sacrifice he is sanctified forever to those who are joined to him. So that his blood was effective in bringing, uh, demonstrating God's once and for all forgiveness for us. And if we have that, we don't need to keep coming back to receive forgiveness. What we may need, because, uh, you know, our sins bother and trouble us, it's right, rightfully they should, but we come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know, I recognize, um, I recognize I sinned or I was wrong in this case. And I thank you that you've already forgiven me and help me by your Holy Spirit to walk in your ways, to not repeat the same patterns that I have in the past. And, and with your um, strength, I can do that. Uh, but it's not a continual coming back, just trying to get forgiven. We walk in a state of knowing that we are forgiven and that through his spirit, we don't have to continue in this. I call it the hamster wheel of, I heard one uh, preacher, not a grace preacher, uh, I won't name the denomination talking about this wheel that we come up here and we sin. Then we go, we confess our sins. Then we get forgiven. Then we come up again. We sin again, do the same thing. And there was no release from this. It would be like a hamster wheel. No, we have something better. Uh, we have forgiveness of sins. It allows us then when we do sin. Uh, the, uh, First John tells us that we have an advocate with the father. He said, hey, uh, and he doesn't have to convince the father. Uh, an advocate is really someone on our side, and he's with the Father. He's he's the Holy Spirit. Um, it's uh, in John 16. It talks about the Holy Spirit. The language is, uh, and we, when He, that is the Holy Spirit, comes, He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then don't end there because it says that He will convince the world of the sin that they do not believe in Me. That's the sin of unbelief. That is the only sin that the Holy Spirit is bringing conviction of. And it, he should convict us, too. When we uh, act and believe and think, we're acting in unbelieving ways in the Father, then he should convict us that, hey, let's put our faith in, in the Father and trust him and walk and rest in him. Then it says the Holy Spirit um, convicts the world of righteousness. He says, because I've gone to the Father. Well, because Christ now has died and resurrected and gone uh, as part of the new covenant, he says, you are made righteous through my spirit. So the Holy Spirit often has to convince us of our righteousness in Christ. And then as to the judgment, it ends because the ruler of this world has been judged. Well, who is that ruler? The judgment is upon Satan. He is the one in this very passage we've gone through. He's the one that deceived Adam and Eve. He's the one that brought about uh, sin. And now Adam is respond is culpable. I don't mean that uh, they were blameless, but I am saying that the ultimate blame is on the deceiver, the liar, the one that seeks to come to uh, rob, steal, and destroy. And that's where ultimately the judgment falls. And we see that in uh, Revelation 20, that, um, that uh, it is specifically Satan himself that will be thrown in the lake of fire and will be tormented forever. Not human beings, by the way. Uh, and to go beyond that goes beyond my scriptural understanding of the meaning of that. But the judgment is ultimate. The final and continuing judgment is upon Satan. And humans uh, bear the consequences of sin, which is death if they don't, if they don't receive Christ to receive eternal life. The next section and then is... Actually, I guess we're moving right into that. Our death, F. 
the ultimate trajectory of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, unless overcome by eternal life, is death. Quote, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sin. End of passage. Now, notice in this passage, it says, God does not bring death. Sin itself causes death. It said, and death through sin, is what the passage said. For the deep-seated driver that I alluded to earlier, cut off from oxygen, no one is causing his death. He requires oxygen to live. So Christ came to overcome death by providing the oxygen of eternal life to men. Quote, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundant. Those are the words of Christ. What did he say he came to do? They didn't say he came to die on a cross. He didn't say... He came to condemn sin. He didn't say he came to make bad men good men, to correct moral behavior, immoral behavior, to make a moral behavior. He said he came to give us life, that is eternal life, and life abundantly. While, coming back to the text, while the serpent in the garden came to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus came to undo that work and provide eternal life, the very antidote to sin and death. Quote, for the sin... For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2. Now, moving on, number four, this is another category of the consequences of sin is the curses and promises, Satan being cursed and a redeemer promised. Following the blame shifting, the Lord pronounces curses and promises. Note who gets cursed first. Uh, Genesis 3, 14 through 19, reading now, the Lord said to the serpent, so his first curse is coming upon the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. End of passage. The serpent representing Satan is cursed to go around on his belly and eat dust all his life. Perhaps the serpent eating dust represents Satan's voracious appetite to consume the life of humans who in Adam were made from dust. God, that's a speculation. God judges Adam, calling him dust. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. End of quote. God does not leave Adam and Eve hopeless, however. He promises a redeemer, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. There will be enmity between the woman's offspring and the serpent's offspring, and the serpent will bruise Christ's heel, but Christ will bruise Satan's head. While the pain caused to Christ's heel is real, it is not a fatal bruising because Christ will rise again. The bruising of the Satan's head, however, will ultimately cause his full defeat. To the woman, now, the God turns and says, Genesis 3.16, To the woman, he, the Lord, said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and in pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. End of passage. While there is to be difficulty for the woman because of her willful alienation from the Lord, the difficulty always also carries joy, the joy of having children. This joy, however, will involve pain, not just in childbirth, but hinting at the sorrows of mothers raising children with the same human traits seen, same human traits seen in their parents, leading often to heartache as well as joy. Think of Jesus' mother seated at the foot of the cross heartbroken over the suffering of the child she had had, she had birthed. The pronouncement of the husband ruling over the woman can again be a curse or a blessing, depending on whether the husband rules with the same love that Christ demonstrates to the church as head over the church, Ephesians 5.25. In Christ, the husband can prove a blessing to the wife. If the husband rules from any degree of self-interest, it can be a curse. Now, returning to Adam. And in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, then to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. 
Curses the ground because of you. In toil you will eat all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles will grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat bread till you return to ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. End of passage. We must see that the Lord does not curse the man Adam. He did not per this is really not a curse on Adam. He curses the ground, which will make it difficult for man to make his living. Man now will need to toil, even sweat, to be able to feed himself. This need for man to work, at least in the natural Adamic sense, can be either a blessing or a curse for man. Again, depending on whether man will turn the to the Lord in his work. I'm quoting Colossians 3, 17 and 23 through 24, where we're instructed by Paul to say, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Three dots. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. And the passage. The key to whatever we do for the Lord uh, not making a living or to gain a reward. The key is to do whatever we do for the Lord, not to make a living or to gain a reward. Then we can draw from his strength when the reward is from him. We'll always find our motivation a bountiful reward. All I'm saying that is um, work itself can be a blessing for many, particularly as we yield the Lord. It has difficulties in it, as all life does. But in turning it over to the Lord, then he can prosper us to the degree that he, uh, 1 John talks about a prosperity that begins, I, uh, Apostle John prays, I pray that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. What's the priority there? Even as your soul prospers. So God will prosper us primarily uh, and foremost in our soul, then allowing us to prosper in health and other forms of prosperity, not the other way around. Sometimes the difficulty and hardship in life um, will actually bring about a prosperity of soul as we are broken in our difficulties and learn to walk more closely with the Lord through, through the experience of human life. Uh, number five, then, is God's symbolic atonement for Adam and Eve's sin, which was a temporary animal substitution. Following the pronouncements and blessings for men and women, Despite their disobedience, quote, the Lord made garment, garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them, end quote, Genesis 3.21. We can see in the animal skins the type of animal substitution in lieu of death for Adam and Eve. This substitution, however, was only a temporary fix, prefiguring Christ as the Passover man. It did, however, provide Adam and Eve a temporary covering of their nakedness until the perfect sacrifice would come in Jesus Christ. Number six, blocking the way of life, blocking the way to the tree of life and his reason, parenthetical, our need to see God's love in order to believe and receive forgiveness and relationship, and parent. Okay. And now we pick this up again, Genesis 3, 22 and 24. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, now he might stretch out his hand and take the eat also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. I know to my point there that if man was immortal, he was going to live forever anyway, then eating the tree of life would add nothing to living forever, which this text there is a proof text that man, Adam himself was mortal. Even the fact that the Lord warned him that he would die means that he is mortal. He can die. Uh, picking up the text, though, therefore the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. End of text. This is an incredibly important aspect of Adam and Eve's story. We return to that most important tree, the tree of life. Although the tree of life was placed in the center of the garden, Genesis 2, 9, Adam and Eve had not eaten of it. We've already covered how this tree gives eternal life. If the tree of life represents eternal life, and if God is, quote, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, end quote, 2 Peter 3, 9, 
Why would God block Adam and Eve from the garden and specifically from eating from the tree of life? God must first overcome Adam and Eve's alienation before he can make the gift of eternal life available to them. This he does through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Only through God the Father and Jesus Christ's demonstration of love for man upon the cross can man finally believe in God's forgiveness and his unconditional love and acceptance of man. Only upon this healing work of faith in man can eternal life be given to man. God would not have Adam and Eve live eternally without knowing of their complete forgiveness and God's unconditional love and acceptance. Neither will have any of us live eternally in that condition. And um, parenthetically, my book, The Debate Over Hell, analyzes the scriptural end for those who die in the state of unbelief, which I've already said. Um, I use elsewhere an analogy here, and I'll use it here, uh, to try to demonstrate for you why this demonstration of God's love for us came through the cross. Now, uh, as I've just stated, uh, God had forgiven Adam and Eve, and yet the he had forgiven them, but that didn't remove from them the consequences of their sin, which was death. Uh, because forgiveness of sin is not the same as giving and receiving of eternal life. And that's a very important concept that is conflated, actually, in the good part of the body of Christ. And I make a point of that uh, in this debate over hell in my argument against universalism. God has universally forgiven mankind, including Adam and Eve, including all mankind uh, in various places. First John says um, uh, Christ's blood was a propitiation for the whole world. Uh, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was not a limited atonement. Christ died, and there's a chapter, I'm forgetting, it's either 9 or 11 in this book where we'll get to the, the putting into bed a limited atonement, but a universal atonement for all mankind. But that is not uh, a universal eternal life for everyone because in our forgiven state, now we're in a position to be able to receive eternal life. And Adam was forgiven. There, Adam and Eve were forgiven. God came and sought them out. He clothed them with the skins of animals, but they had not eaten of the tree of life, so they did not have eternal life. So now, uh, to come back to this analogy, let's say that you came um, to me, uh, that you you did something that was pretty horrific towards me, something that either was a terrible offense to me or caused me a great amount of damage, and yet you wanted a relationship with me. You might come to me and say, um, I'd like to ask your forgiveness. And if if my heart was right, I might say, yes, I do forgive you. But for you to receive that forgiveness, you'd have to really believe that I forgave you. Now, you might not do that. Furthermore, to have a continued walk with one another, you would need to be convinced of my desire to have a relationship with you, which I'll describe as love. Now, Adam and Eve had, did not have that. And they could not have it, would not have it until it was demonstrated in Christ. So uh, to follow the analogy. So I I tell you, I forgive you. You know, take it on my word. I forgive you. And yet you don't fully believe me. You have a hard time understanding that forgiveness. But then we're walking down the street together and this bus comes careening down the road and I see it and I jump out between you and the bus and I hit and, and I lay down my life for you. I think that would convince you that my laying down my life for you in love, that not only had I forgiven you of whatever you did that might have offended me, but further than that, I love you and I love you so much I lay my life down for you. And that's a uh, an analogy trying to express the demonstration of Father's love in Christ for us, that he would actually lay his life down to demonstrate that love, to invite us into this relationship. Um, now, what overcomes our alienation, our faith, and our new nature in Christ? That's the next heading. Gustav Allen's Latin category of atonement theories, um, I guess I've mentioned this earlier, we'll come to this in chapter 7, Pre, uh, predominant, predominance in Western theology atonement theories, fundamentally that God's na nature must be, quote, satisfied, end quote, because of man's sin, meaning that some aspect of God needs appeasement. 
Either God's holiness or God's justice has been offended and needs appeasement, according to this theory, making the problem something that man has done to offend God versus the very nature of Adamic man that needs transformation. The category, the other category of subjective atonement theories, in contrast, sees man as basically good, and Christ's death is either a moral example or perhaps a moral influence upon man. Both subjective and Latin, the Latin is that satisfaction, theories fail to reach New Covenant one because both mistakenly emphasize change in man's behavior and miss the necessary change in man's nature necessary to God's goal of new covenant one man. Holland's third category of atonement theories, what he calls the classic or Christus victor, looks correctly to Christ's victory to set men free from the various hindrances to that one man. So Christus victor, however, does not address the change in man's nature necessary to participate in new covenant one man. And I'm going to come back to this in chapter seven. I've seen here that this may, out of context, not make much sense. So what is needed for this full realization of New Covenant 1? First, man needs to be persuaded that God has forgiven his sins, and that God unconditionally loves him, and that God desires him to receive the gift of his eternal life in order to share his life with God. This needs to be received on a heartfelt, personal basis, and this is true biblical faith. So that's what I'm aiming at here, and that's a uh, a uh, fairly short summary of what I would call the true gospel of Christ, a gospel of God, uh, full acceptance, forgiveness, and vitamins into eternal life and relationship. Scriptures provide no formulaic confession that must be recited. The Apostle Paul, however, does say this, and this is Romans 10, 8 through 13. What then does it say? Quote, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith, which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and from the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, quote, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, end quote. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord over all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. End of passage. Here the requirement is simply believing from the heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessing Jesus as the Lord with the simple conclusion, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. This notion of calling on the name of the Lord needs some application. When those in Christ are born into a kinship relationship, we take on that family name. So when one calls on the name of the Lord, we can understand this as calling on the family surname. Perhaps this is part of the new name that will be given. I'm quoting Revelation 3.12. He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of God, of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. End of passage. This faith in the love of God leads to and is necessary to receive and possess eternal life. Without this faith in a loving God, man naturally and instinctively chooses to remain independent from a God that he fears. At best, in most man-made religions, he will seek to appease this God or gods so that things will go well with him and perhaps his family, tribe, or nation. This is nothing like faith in Jesus Christ who came to demonstrate the love of God towards man. Faith in a loving God is not just mental assent to Christ's resurrection but the verbal confession of Jesus Lord. It's a living faith that results in the creation of a new nature in the believer. Apostle Paul says, therefore, if any of us in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Second Corinthians, in the passage, 2 Corinthians 5.17. The Greek word translated as new in this passage is the Hebrew is the Greek word rather kainos. The interlinear gives the meaning the meaning of this as quote a new kind, unprecedented, novel, uncommon, unheard of. This is the new nature of those in Christ. It's a new kind, unprecedented, novel, and unheard of kind of creature. It's totally unlike Adam. Uh, this is not restoration to a cleaned up Adam. 
nor a cleaned up creation. The preceding verse affirms that the first things have passed away. Adam was the first and he passed away and now Christ comes and those in Christ continue on. And the old things passed away according to this passage. Our human Adamic nature will always be self-centered sin conscious and un unable to participate in new covenant at one month. we begin our participatory life of union with god with a new faith in god love and acceptance together with a new nature now the next section is entitled it's the last last section before the summary the need for our participatory death and resurrection with christ it's for this reason that the apostle paul so insists on the believer's participatory union in christ death and resurrection and i'll cover that in more detail more detail in the next two chapters so i'm reading now romans 6 1 through 11. what should we say then are we to continue in sin that so grace may abound may it never be how shall we who died to sin live in it or do you not know that all of us who've been baptized in christ jesus have been baptized into his death therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death you see the participation there? Uh, Christ did not die alone, although he was first to die, but we were joined through faith with Christ, became one with Christ. But we also, Paul says, we also died with Christ, so that Christ, so that as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too would walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him, now remember this is the, the center of new covenant at one moment, is our union with Christ. And we'll come up for more emphasis on this chapter 10. In the if So if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. There's a participation. Uh, don't follow this old covenant uh, teaching that uh, pick up your cross and follow me daily. Uh, that was prior to Christ's death. And that's what was going to be required of people under the old covenant. But now, Paul says in this new covenant, we have been crucified with Christ. We don't pick up that cross. We may need to remind ourselves of the cross that we've already passed through. But we're not looking, we're not daily putting ourselves to death. We have died. And we need to know, know this. Paul says early, don't you know? Uh, in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives, lives to God. Even so, now here's Paul, even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin. Don't think you got to keep dying to it. Consider yourself that you are dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Start to realize in what you're in. A watchman he said it this way, oh, the foolishness of trying to enter a room that you're already in. Start accounting for yourself as scriptures teach you in the new covenant of your position in Christ. He died, uh, were buried and rose with him and are seated at the right hand of God the Father along with Christ. Uh, remember, fusion uh, union without fusion or confusion, you don't become Christ and you remain yourself and you never replace Christ, but you're right with him, seated at the right hand of the Father. The Apostle Paul, I come back to the text, the Apostle Paul concludes the very spiritual nature of our union with Christ. His death is also our death and his resurrection is also our resurrection. This death or resurrection with Christ brings us into a new covenant relationship with the Holy Family of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the body of Christ. It also ends the dominion of law and condemnation began when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and intensified when the nation of Israel entered in the old covenant with Mosaic law. The Apostle Paul sums up the entire subject in this next passage, Galatians 2, 19 and 20. For through the law, I died to the law. So that I, I how did that happen? The law, Christ by himself under the law and for our sake and with us, then he died and we died with him through the law. Paul says, I died through the law so that I might live to God. You see, that's the very same thing he was talking about in Romans chapter 6. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the 
faith in the Son of God, or some passages I live by in by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave him up for me. Now, I've talked about this passage before, but you would know this is such a union that at one time Paul says, I don't live, and then the same passages, but now I live. How is that possible? Because his life is now melded and with that of Christ. And he no longer has an independent life, but he also continues as Paul, the life that I now live in Christ. Uh, end of passage. Paul means that Christ Jesus died through the law because the law required death for failing to live up to every commandment perfectly. Paul was under that specific commandment by virtue of being an Israelite. Those not of Israelite birth were never under the of that covenant, although a good part of the church continues as if they were. We, however, were under the law of sin and death, Romans 8, 2, resulting from Adam's introduction to the death-causing sin in all of us. But through the union with Christ, Paul died to that law, both laws, the law of the Old Covenant and also the law of sin and death that Adam generated. And Paul died to the law. He rose with Christ and now lives a life which is hard to tell Paul and Christ apart. And that should be the normative uh, explanation of our union in Christ as well as we continue to grow in that. Paul says that he no longer lives, but he goes on to say that he now lives a new life. Chapter 4 summary. In this chapter, we look first at the nature of sin as willful independence from the Lord. I've come to modify that later in other books. It's the willful independence from the life and will of the Lord. We want to share his life. We also, in that life, want to come subject our will to his. And that's part of this common life in the divine family, expressed by the inner linears to be without a share in or in a quote, lacking in any, any part or in the life of God. Rather, the typical understanding of sin is behaviors that, quote, miss the mark. This is a total breakdown of man's relationship with God, causing man's alienation from God. Hence, for God to overcome sin means far more than just forgiving sin. God's eternal purpose for man has always been a family relationship, such as enjoyed among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, from before the creation of the cosmos. Man was created from the dust and was naturally self-centered, wishing to be in control of his life and independent of God. Adam and Eve chose to eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil in order to, quote, be like God, and quote, rather than eating from the tree of life, represent the eternal life of God himself. These long-term consequences for Adam and his descendants will ultimately be overcome by a redeemer, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's demonstration of God's love for man enables man to accept in faith God's love and acceptance for him and to receive eternal life through God's Spirit. By demonstrating his love for us in the person of Jesus Christ, God has also put a visible face to his love that so helps us perceive God's love. That's the face of Jesus. This is the face of Jesus, even the face of the one who crowned with thorns on our behalf. This leads to the birth of a totally new creature. Then, through our willing cooperation with the Spirit of God, the new man, having been joined in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, ultimately passes through a process of transformation and ultimately bodily resurrection to be fully made in the image of Christ. And this is the process of grace upon grace. So that wraps up this chapter. And um, let me close in prayer. Next chapter, we'll be looking at New Covenant, uh, one month seen in Old Testament typologies. And I hope you'll continue on the series. So Father and, uh, Father and Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit, uh, thank you that you have given us this story, particularly in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, to help us realize our state in Adam, the very uh, need to have you reveal yourself as a loving God that we could then repent, that is, uh, have a metanoia of our thinking about you, that we could then receive the re love and forgiveness you've always had for us. And through that, we could eat of the tree of life. And we have also realized that we no longer can live eating from that tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil in whatever for external form that is, is not, can never lead to life, only leads to death and brings, as Paul pointed out to us, a curse. So help us to fully 
realize in the meaning of these things and Holy Spirit, apply them in our lives that we might grow together in the fullness of Christ, uh, in the body of Christ and in the family of God. So I conclude, Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, may we see you more clearly, may we love you more dearly, and may we walk with you more nearly day by day. Amen.